Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, thank you so much to the center for um, inviting me to present on this today. I'm really excited because a lot of you, I see a lot of familiar faces and names, and a lot of you have reached out to me um, to get information on how to do YPT and PPT by telehealth. And I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything to offer you. And now I do. So I'm very, very excited about this. Um, we're going to take our time to go through um, to go through really how to apply how to use these uh, protocols by telehealth. I'm assuming everyone here has been trained um, and has at least used uh, the manuals with at least one client. I know if you went through the advanced training with me, then you used it with one client and you uh, got consultation from me. And so uh, I'm not going to go through step by step how to use the manuals because you should know, already know that. Um, but I'm going to talk specifically about how to do some of the techniques through telehealth. So let's see. And I'm going to be patient with myself as I use this um, Zoom platform. It's not letting me advance, but I think I know why. Let's see. One second. There we go. Okay, so we all kind of know why we're here. Uh, COVID has kind of forced us into staying at home, out of our clinics, um, even while you know we know that our uh, kids and adolescents who we normally would see in our office are still struggling with mental health disorders such as PTSD. And so those aren't just gonna go away. Um, and so we need to figure out a way to see our clients um, through other methods, through telehealth, through video, uh, platforms through telephone uh, until we can get back into clinics. And in addition, COVID-19 may be exacerbating the stress um, that many families and kids are experiencing right now. They may be exacerbating symptoms of PTSD. They may, um, may be bringing up other traumas from the past that kids have had. Um, and so they may be triggered by some of this um, feeling of, out of being out of control due to COVID-19. So cl clinicians really need to find a way to meet the needs of these kids remotely. Um, so we know telemental health may be challenging. A lot of you have uh, probably started and tried to, uh, try to start seeing clients this way, um, but this also can break down some barriers to treatment. I know in the clinic that I work in, we're very pleasantly surprised to, to see that a lot of our clients are actually attending more consistently now because they don't have the issues with transportation, or uh, the long distance to travel. So telehealth can really be helpful in those situations. And so before beginning uh, telehealth for PTSD, we need to think about the technical issues. We need to think about which clients may be appropriate for this. Um, and so there are a number of things to consider I'm gonna go through. Uh, but I'm assuming a lot of you have already set up your platforms. I'm not going to talk about the various platforms such as Zoom, um, the ECW platform, OmniJoin, different platforms that you may be using. I'm assuming you all um, have already set that up because it's been a couple months now that we've been working remotely. If you have questions about that, I'd be happy to try to answer that at the end. But for now, um, I'm most familiar with Zoom, and so I'll be mostly talking about that, although you will be able to use a lot of these techniques with other platforms. Um, before you start, it's important to uh, make sure you have your emergency protocol set up uh, with your clients. Make sure you have a phone number, an address um, for the physical location where the clients are. Um, before you start, of course, you need to get consent. Um, you can do that remotely. You can have them sign and send, email it to you. You can have them sign a paper copy and send it to you. Um, all these things are kind of standard as, as you would in an office, um, making sure you get consent. And, but especially adding the part about telehealth. Is it okay for the child uh, to be participating over the internet, really, over uh, video uh, platforms? So get spe special consent for that. Uh, and each of you will have a different process in your different offices. One thing that's really important when working with children and adolescents is to make sure the caregiver will be present for each session. So I'm gonna talk about whether it's appropriate to have the, the caregiver actually in the room or next to the client um, for the sessions or, or not, but we do want parents to be at least home or in the same location as the clients for the entire duration of the therapy sessions. 
uh, just in case there is an emergency, we need to be able to make sure that there's an adult present to, who can help. Um, also making sure you ensure the identity of clients. This might be especially important for um, you know, new patients that you haven't previously seen in your office. Just making sure that, um, that you, you know who you're, you're delivering these services to, you know who all is in the home, uh, especially if you can hear other voices, you want to know who's all there. So making sure you, you get that set up before you start. As far as determining whether kids are appropriate for uh, PTSD therapy by telehealth, um, there are some things to consider. You may need to rule out that the child has, um, doesn't have severe externalizing behavior. So for example, you know, are they gonna pick up and throw the laptop across the room you know, if they get upset? Um, really, really serious things that would um, interfere with treatment. Um, and then, Suicidality is important to uh, assess before getting started. So uh, past history of suicidal ideation may not be a rule out, but current, of course, current suicidal ideation is important to assess and make sure that, uh, you know, telehealth treatment is appropriate, just as you would determine whether or not outpatient tr uh, treatment would be appropriate. Does the, does the child need to be um, in the hospital or can they be safe enough to uh, participate in treatment by telehealth? So that's one thing to really uh, ask before you get started and assess thoroughly. Um, other safety concerns that you need to think about are, you know, ongoing do domestic violence in the home. There may be evidence of that as you're um, sort of um, talking over the, uh, video platforms to your clients. You may hear, hear evidence of that in the background. You may be aware of it. You may know that there's a history. And so really trying to assess for the safety concerns in the home is really important. Also, is the abuser, so for kids who maybe their trauma is abuse, is the abuser in the same home? That's, that may be a rule out for doing this treatment, likely would be, because of the lack of privacy and the lack of sense of safety. And we also want to make sure that the trauma is not ongoing. If it's ongoing, then PTSD treatment actually is not going to be effective. We need to address the safety concerns rather than treating PTSD. It's important to remember telehealth is really not for emergencies, um, and emergencies meaning uh, danger to self or others. Um, and so you want to really establish that protocol with your clients um, before you start therapies, such as you know, if the child becomes a danger to himself or others, what you will do. So you may have the caregiver call 911, you may have them call the local um, hotline for uh, the police to come out and do a wellness check. Uh, there are a number of different uh, things that you can set up ahead of time. Um, but it would be very difficult to walk through an emergency with um, caregivers by telehealth uh, without something already established before you start. And then thinking about the age of the child, can they participate in front of the camera for a long time? So, um, you know, preschool PTSD treatment was designed for ages three to six. And I'm going to talk about how to use the techniques with younger ch children, but um, it may be very difficult for a three-year-old to participate. Um, a four-year-old may be able to do it a little better. They may be used to sitting more in a classroom for longer periods of time at a table. Their caregivers may be able to support them in um, completing some of the activities, they may be able to modify some of the treatments for a younger child but really consider whether the child that you have been referred can uh, actually participate in telehealth before you begin. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and then of course, as you would in your office, it's important to complete a PTSD screening. So those of you have, who have done the training with me um, know that I always have you complete a PTSD screening with your clients before starting such therapy. You don't want to get in the middle of it and then realize it really wasn't appropriate or really isn't PTSD that the children have. It may be some other, maybe depression or maybe some other issue that they're, they're really struggling with and not PTSD. So you want to go ahead and complete that as you would. And I'm going to talk about how to do that, but making sure they act, at least have some symptoms of PTSD, the trauma is not ongoing, and that they are willing to talk about uh, what happened to them because that is part of this therapy, as you know. And then of course, establishing the commitment of the caregiver and the client to participate. Um, so you want to discuss with them what this is gonna look like, maybe have a few practice sessions with them, talk with them about um, how they might feel doing um, 
therapy by uh, over the computer. Um, talk with them about if they can dedicate the time. So many caregivers, of course, are working from home and they don't necessarily have a lot of time, but it would be important for them to dedicate at least, um, you know, the full session time and maybe some time after the session to, to be with the child and make sure the child is, um, is okay following the session. So, you know, it could be up to an hour and a half that you might be asking caregivers to dedicate to this each week in person. So you want to talk with them about this, what this would look like, how you can make any kind of modifications if needed, um, and um, make sure that the child is also willing to participate. And so that can be a little bit difficult with younger children, but certainly adolescents and older kids can, can let you know uh, what they're thinking and feeling about this and making sure that they, they want to do it. And, you know, I think that we should, we've all learned something about telehealth in the past couple of months, and that's don't assume. Don't assume that a particular family cannot do it. They may, they may surprise you and they may um, be very, very committed to um, helping the child recover from trauma and helping the child feel better and may be willing to make a lot of adjustments in their home, at least for that uh, one hour a week to um, help the child and participate in therapy. So even if a, a family may look like they're not gonna be able to participate kind of on paper because they have too many barriers or too many things going on, have a conversation with them and maybe a few practice sessions to see if it might be possible. So again, uh, many of you have already uh, probably started doing telehealth, um, but I'm gonna go through some things to consider that you might not have thought of regarding how to set up telehealth as far as the clients um, in the client's home and then in your space. So for the client, it's important to help the caregiver select the best spot for the session. So you want, Ideally, you want the client to be able to have a uh, private space for therapy um, where they won't be able to be heard by others. Um, they feel like they have um, some privacy in talking with you. Um, even if their caregiver is there, it would, might be nice for them to not be overheard by all of their siblings. And this can be very challenging in some homes, but ideally you do wanna have some privacy. You wanna have their uh, laptop or iPad or phone, um, as close to the you know, modem as possible to have the best internet signal. Um, and so that the Wi-Fi connection you know, will be stable throughout the session. So maybe talking, about, talking with the caregiver about the best place where, or maybe even moving uh, the connection so that they can have the ideal location for their therapy session. So the internet signal is not going in and out. You wanna make sure that they have enough space. So um, if it's a you know, crowded little spot, in the kitchen or something, there may not, may not be enough space for the child to uh, do their uh, worksheets and handouts that you're gonna be having them do. Um, it would be best to have them at a table or a desk if possible. Many kids have been doing um, school remotely and so maybe they already have a, a desk or a little area set up where this would be possible. Um, and then minimize as many distractions as possible. So different toys, you know, you don't wanna have a lot of toys and things on the table. Um, other things going on in the house, uh, if possible, um, maybe in outside for the time that they're doing session. So really walk through all of that with the clients. And discuss your expectations. So help them understand that this is an appointment. And so they should dress appropri appropriately. They should not um, show up to the session in their pajamas or lying on their bed or under the covers. Um, you know, you want them, again, sitting up, you know, at a desk or table appropriately dressed as if they were going to an office. And that's the same for parents as well. Um, and so I've heard many stories about, about uh, patients kind of lying in their bed or the kids not wanting to get out of bed and just kind of talking to the therapist by, um, you know, just um, while they're lying on their pillow, but you want to talk about that ahead of time with them. And then for the clinician, same for us, of course, we're going to be professional and we're going to, um, uh, you know, convey that, that we take this uh, as seriously as they do, even though we're at both maybe at our homes, um, we're still, this is still a professional appointment. And it might be nice to establish a visual of where you're sitting. So you might want to show the child and the caregiver your office, kind of move the camera around, let them see um, what's behind you, let them see the room that you're in, different things. Of course, you, you're gonna maybe not show them anything too personal. But um, help them see you know, that there's nobody in the room for nobody else in the room, for example, who may be listening to the session. You want to let them know that, um, that it's a private area. 
Um, and then uh, you might ask, uh, you might consider your background. So you could change, you know, for on Zoom, you can change your background. I still haven't really mastered that, but you can change the background of um, where you're sitting. So that's just maybe a blank screen or some kind of picture behind you. Um, and um, another thing is to think about, especially for younger children, they need to know that this is happening in real time. They may, they may be used to um, using FaceTime to talk with relatives, but they may not be. And so you want to, you know, kind of say, oh, I see you. I see that you're, you know, you're wearing a red shirt. I see that you're raising your hand, you're waving, you're smiling, you know, to let them know that you're actually seeing them in real time. This is not a recorded video, um, that you're actually talking back and forth and having a conversation. Um, and then some clients may need reassurance that the session is not going to be viewed over the internet and that it's not open for anyone else to just join and look, look at. Um, and if you have to record it for some reason, please explain to them why and get their consent. Um, they may not be comfortable with that. They may want to understand the reasons why. Um, you know, if you're in training, you may need your supervisor to view it. There may be good reasons why, but just let them know what you will do with that recording and see if they have any questions about that. And just some other tips before we get started talking about the actual uh, therapies. Um, like I mentioned, it might be helpful to test run a few sessions with them to not only troubleshoot, but to um, sort of establish rapport over uh, video conference. So you might need a few extra sessions. You know, usually if you've done training with me, I'll have you pretty much jump right into the therapy after you do the assessment. But for, for telehealth, it might be important to have one or two shorter sessions just to, to um, establish rapport with the clients, with the kids especially, see how it's going to go. Just see how telehealth is going to go. Are they going to run out of the room? Are they gonna, um, you know, maybe they just need a chance to show you their room and show you different things in their house and then they'll settle down. And you don't want them doing that on the first day that you're trying to do the therapy. So maybe have a couple extra sessions to kind of let the novelty of telehealth wear off and um, let everybody feel comfortable and then maybe get started with the therapy. Um, because you're, you know, you're not in the same room, those nonverbal cues are really, really hard to read, right? So you want to check in frequently with the clients to make sure that you're communicating well. Um, you may use summary statements, reflections, you know, summarize what the kids are saying to make sure you heard them. Um, in the sessions that I've been observing um, through our clinic, um, it, often I'll hear other people talking in the background or I'll hear the caregiver and child talking to each other. And so I, I think it's helpful to, you know, have them really speak louder make sure that you can hear them, you know, if they have something um, that they, they think is important to say that, that, you know, really would be good for the therapist to hear it as well so that you can help with whatever they're discussing. Um, and then, you know, just show that you're listening, show that you, um, that you're attentive, looking at the camera, and that's, that's a good way to communicate as well. You may want to use exaggerated gestures or facial expressions, especially for younger kids, especially if you have, tend to have kind of a flatter affect, uh, affect, it may be um, more difficult to read you as a therapist as well. And so you might wanna exaggerate that a little bit, especially for younger kids. Um, and then you wanna check in again to make sure they understand the rationale for what you're doing. So it's a little bit more difficult when you are asking um, families to do, for example, exposures, exposures to scary things that have happened to them. Um, you don't have as much kind of feel for how they're doing uh, over, over telehealth. You, don't, you can't really pick up on their anxiety as much. You really need to ask them how they're feeling about the different techniques that you're asking them to do um, and make sure they're comfortable with it. And if they're not, then you can address that anxiety you know, using CBT as well. You can kind of talk through that with them and hopefully get them on board with um, following through with the, the regular techniques. Um, one thing I've learned a lot is having a lot of patience and allowing a lot more time for clients to respond. So we tend to fire rapid fire questions at kids sometimes, and um, they may be wanting to answer us, but we need to give them space and time to do that, especially over telehealth. Um, so again, make sure that they've finished what they're saying before you go on to the next thing. Um, even as you're trying to kind of keep up the pace. So this, you know, takes a lot of kind of energy. You know, we've heard a lot about Zoom fatigue, and this is, this is certainly something that takes a lot of, um, 
of our mental effort to do. But I think as we are uh, practicing, we're going to get a lot better at this, and clients too are going to get more used to it as well. Um, it might be helpful to have a plan for what happens when there's a technical failure. So, um, for example, if you do have cell phones, you may say, you know, um, if, it, if the internet, if we lose connection, then I'm going to text you uh, what to do next. Or you might say, okay, um, you know, if we lose internet connection, I'll call you and we'll continue the session by phone. Or if you need to reschedule, then you can do that as well. But have some plan ahead of time so that um, you're not kind of scrambling if you do lose connection. And certainly try to um, use some humor when these things happen. Of course, they're going to happen probably every, every time you talk and just, um, you know, it's okay to just kind of roll with it and, and try to do your best with trying to address the problems. Uh, because it's a new format for most of us, we may need more prep time than with in-person sessions. So if you've been doing this therapy uh, or if you've been doing CBT you know, in your office for many, many years, you may have your standard kind of handouts that you copy and you just have a stack of them all set up in your office. You may need to do more prep. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that and, and different ways that you can have things already prepared. But just remember with technical issues and getting, getting connected um, online, you know, that may take a little bit longer. So allow yourself more time between sessions to, um, to prepare to start the next session. Uh, as I mentioned, you might need to have shorter sessions for younger kids. They may be able to tolerate 20 or 30 minutes and that's okay. You can still get a lot done in that little amount of time. Um, I'm going to talk more about behavioral management strategies, but for anxious or defiant kids, you might want to um, use your typical kind of praise when you see something going well and then um, may, maybe using the caregiver to help you uh, redirect the child if needed. Um, you might ask the caregiver to turn off the self-monitoring feature for kids who are more anxious. Maybe they don't want to see themselves um, in the, in the uh, computer screen. They may be more self-conscious, so you might want to have that turned off if needed. Again, looking at the camera. And then I'm going to talk a lot about using the screen sharing feature. So again, this is um, through Zoom. You can do this, but I'm sure with a lot of other platforms you can as well. Be patient with yourself. And as usual for this therapy, as I always try to um, communicate during trainings, you want to convey confidence that this is going to work, uh, optimism that they can get better, and reassurance, even when things get hard, that they can do it. And so uh, I try to have that from the outset. You know, um, even though you may be nervous starting this um, telehealth, you want to convey that, you know, you're going to get through this together and that uh, they will get better if they follow, uh, follow the um, protocol with you. All right. So um, I'm going to start to talk about actually applying the uh, YPT and PPT. But as usual, as I discussed, we want to always do a PTSD screening by telehealth first. And so many of you um, have used the young child PTSD checklist that I've sent out to you following trainings or the older kid version child PTSD checklist, which has a caregiver version and a, a child report version. Of course, there are other PTSD measures that you may be familiar with and you may prefer to use, that's fine. The ones that I mentioned are developed by Dr. Skeringa, who developed these manuals and he, um, he has made them available for free. So we can send those out after the training if you don't have them already. Um, as far as administration of the measures, you want to make sure that um, because you're not going to be in the room, you want to make sure that the clients have the questions in front of them. And um, for example, caregivers, you will be able to read along. So you may have various ways of, of doing this. So you can either um, email it to them if you, have their, if you have that ability and the clients have email or if they have a printer, they can print it out. That would be great. Um, otherwise, you can use the screen sharing um, feature for example, in Zoom, and I'll show, show you how to do that. And then another idea, and we may be doing this through the center, is to um, copy the questions into a PowerPoint using a very large font um, and then create your response scale. So I'm going to show you how that might look. Uh, you can read it to the client. And again, of course, I'm just reminding you to use that matter of fact tone when you're asking about trauma. Um, you don't want to really convey that, you know, that you're feeling anxious asking about it or that this is really, really hard to talk about and you know, they may be too anxious to answer. 
you know, just kind of treat it as a matter of fact, reason for why they're seeing you and the reason for, um, for you asking is to help them get better. Um, but privacy is important. And so you, again, wanna consider whether the caregiver should be present for the, the assessment. And I'm talking about older kids um, completing their checklist because of course the younger kids, uh, three to six, the caregiver um, completes that themselves. So you wanna decide whether or not the caregiver should be present for that administration for the older kids. Okay, so I'm gonna try to show you the um, measure online, how it would look if you showed just the questionnaire. So here's, here's the questionnaire. If you show uh, screen sh sharing, you could do it this way and maybe zoom it in to make it bigger. And so you're gonna kind of scroll through um, hopefully this is familiar to many of you. This is the child PTSD checklist, um, child version. And um, just a thumbs up if you can see this because I, because uh, Lindsay's not here. I'm not sure if she, uh, if you guys can see this measure or not. If you can see the uh, word version, just give me a thumbs up. Great, thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, and so you could scroll through and again say, you know, um, I'm going to be asking you questions about um, different scary things that you might have experienced or that your child might have experienced. And again, remember to count for a trauma. It, you might have, um, you, you should have felt, you must have felt like you might die or that you had a serious injury or that you saw someone else get a serious injury or um, die. And so you go through your list of traumas and did this happen? If it did, tell me what age you were the first time, the last time, and about how many times it happened. So you could scroll through all that and go on to the symptoms page. So that's one way to do it. And you may want to have your, um, your paper version filling it out on your desk if that's easy for you. Um, here I'll show you this fancy thing that I just discovered where you can kind of draw and zoom um, and kind of complete it with the, the client as you are going through it all. So that's one way to do it. Another way, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. And show you um, that you can also put it into your make it bigger in your in a PowerPoint and so this is one way to do all of your handouts and so we may be able to um, create materials to send out that's one thing that we're going to be working on in the next couple of weeks or so to send out to everyone so that you might have a PowerPoint um, slide deck with all of the questions. So it might be a little bit easier, more visually appealing for um, kids to see and for you to read from. But again, this is another way to do it. Um, go through each of the traumatic events um, this way and the symptom question. And then of course, um, once you're done with the assessment, you um, score up the results. Uh, you, may, you may not do that in front of the family, but you may do that between sessions and then set up a time to give them feedback. So let them know what the results of the uh, screening were. Let them know, you know, I love to do this with older kids as well because it can be, it can be really motivating for them to see their scores and to, to understand that, wow, you know, the things that I'm experiencing, the things that I'm feeling, you know, are represented in this way and that, um, you know, you help them see that, yes, it makes sense that you're really struggling because you told me about these and these things that happen. Um, and so provide, providing that feedback to them can be really helpful. Um, and then you want to discuss, okay, now, now that they may meet criteria for PTSD, or at least they have some symptoms and are willing to talk about the trauma, you want to ask them, you know, how, about the safety concerns, has the trauma ceased? And this is especially important doing telehealth because you have very, very little control over that home environment where they'll be doing the therapy. So you wanna make sure that they're safe, that the trauma has ceased, no um, issues with proceeding with trauma as far as a, from a safety perspective. 
and then talking through the pros and cons of proceeding with therapy. So um, a pro would be, of course, that they would get better. A con may be that they, you really don't have the privacy to do it and that maybe they can, you know, maybe they can hold off for a couple more weeks and maybe, um, maybe you'll be back in our office. Of course, we don't know when we'll be back in our office seeing, seeing patients or maybe you're starting to set that up now. Uh, really varies by location. So you want to talk, you know, what, what are the benefits of doing this now or, um, or waiting a little bit. Um, and then uh, talk about the commitment and feasibility of proceeding with telehealth. Again, all those details I worked through are already presented to you earlier in the presentation. And then um, ask if the caregiver can or will be present for the session. So what if the caregiver's sick? What if they have COVID? What if they're quarantining themselves in their bedroom and they really cannot participate? Could they do it by you know, another laptop? Are there ways for the caregiver to participate um, even if they may be sick and not able to be with the child in their in the um, same room, so there those are some just those are some options that you might want to think about before beginning. And then the other the other thing to discuss is really talking about that you will making sure they understand you will be talking directly about the trauma that happened, and um, we'll talk more about this in a minute. But making sure caregivers know to um, to to think about what their response will be. Once the, the child starts talking about their trauma, how will they respond to the child? Um, how will they feel? Um, and then if they need a, another session with you to talk about that, that would be important to, to schedule. So I wanna go ahead and take a pulse of the audience right now and see, Lindsay, if there are any uh, questions in the chat or anything that people have um, about the material I've already presented. I'm going to unmute everybody for a second. So if you have a question, feel free to speak. Okay. I thought I felt something in the chat, but I wasn't, wasn't sure if that, those were questions or not. Any questions right now about what I've already talked about? No. If you do, just feel free to uh, type it into the chat and Lindsay will be my. Let's see. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. All right. Um, so let's go on to um, starting with session, session one, which is the psychoeducation and rapport building session, of course. And again, I'm not going to go through each part of the manual um, because I'm assuming most of you have had the training and then you can also, of course, read the, read the manual. Um, if you have not yet had the training, um, I do encourage you to take it um, to next time we offer it, which hopefully will be in the coming months, um, that you do the in-person training with me and then do the ongoing consultation. Um, I could also start um, having consultation calls um, as Lindsay mentioned. And so uh, maybe you've received the training in the past but you didn't get the consultation because you didn't have a client or you didn't have the time, that, that would be fine as well. We can start resuming those consultation calls. Um, so again, I'm not gonna go through each step but um, talking about some of the things that you can actually um, adjust or adapt using telehealth. So session one always has the parent and child together. So you'll have that as usual. And then uh, typically we have you um, provide them two folders or binders. So you may need to mail that to your clients in advance if they're unable to purchase it themselves. You may need to do that. Or you could create an uh, electronic book. And, you know, of course, in the manual, it's referred to as the roadway book. Um, so you could create an electronic roadway book. Um, using PowerPoint or uh, just Microsoft Word and decorating it with clip art, etc. cetera. Um, if they are gonna be using a paper book, then make sure that the clients have the materials they need, the markers, crayons, et cetera, stickers. And then you might want to either mail them a packet of all the handouts or email that and see if they can print it and go ahead and have all those um, ready to go for your session so you're not fumbling through that each week. Um, 
for younger kids, uh, of course, for the, the psychoeducation piece about PTSD, you're going to be um, using those pictorial aids that are available in the pre preschool PTSD treatment manual. Um, using those pictorial aids to describe PTSD and talk about it. And I'm going to walk through that in just a moment. Um, for older kids, you could make up a game using the symptoms. So you could create a, a PowerPoint slide a presentation with you know, Jeopardy style questions and have them answer it back to you to, um, to teach them about PTSD. So there are a variety of ways you can make this fun because you really do want to kind of set the, the stage for it being engaging and interactive and um, facilitating their wanting to come back, um, wanting to come for the next session. You know, in the manual, we talk about having snacks and candy, um, giving the little kids a little piece of candy to start to get them to the table to get ready to work. That might be something that the caregiver can do as well. Of course, you, you won't be providing that, but it's possible caregivers might do that and then having a little snack at the end of session might be nice as well. So talking with the caregiver about that. Um, and then you're gonna proceed with the other session content as usual. So talking about reluctance, for example, and talking about the overview of the 12 sessions. But here's a way you might um, use PowerPoint for uh, psychoeducation about PTSD symptoms. So again, um, we're gonna try to have these materials available for you. But what I've done here is just simply take a screenshot of the different handouts and uploaded or uh, inserted that into PowerPoint. And I'm gonna walk through how you might do um, psychoeducation with a younger child. So if you remember what you do is you say, you know, here's a little girl, what should her name be? Let's say her name is Mary. Uh, one day Mary was um, in her neighborhood and she was playing with her siblings and all of her siblings crossed the street and she um, crossed behind them and got hit by a car. And now every time um, it, she, she thinks about that, even when she doesn't want to, and she can't, can't make those thoughts stop. Even when she's lying in bed, she thinks about it and she even has bad dreams about the time she was hit by a car. Even when she's playing on that corner, if she sees a car drive by, she thinks about um, the time she was hit and she feels really bad and shaky whenever she's um, in that area. But then she came to see me, she came to see me over the uh, computer and we uh, learned different ways to make her scary thoughts and feelings go away. Would you like to do that? So you ask the, the child if they would like to participate and learn to make their scary thoughts and feelings go away. And so you show the, the picture of the happy girl. So this is one way to do this um, using kind of an electronic uh, visual aids to teach about PTSD. And so of course that would be for a younger kid. Um, you may be up to age six uh, would be fine, six or seven, probably not older than that. Um, but as I mentioned for older kids, you can do kind of a mix and match game or some other kind of game to help them um, learn about the symptoms. One thing I will caution you on though, is you can get pretty fancy with, with all of this, um, but you don't wanna spend much more time than you normally would on these um, parts of the therapy because you do want to try to move through all the pieces. And so this could take a pretty long time playing a, a, a mix and match game or Jeopardy, Jeopardy kind of game with an older kid on, on the psychoeducation piece, but there are other things to get to in the session as you know. So you really wanna plan out your time and don't, um, don't have the session go much beyond uh, a regular therapy session of about 50 minutes for an older kid. Um, so continuing with session one, um, another part of that is rapport building. And the way that that's done in, in this therapy is through the About You worksheet. And again, you could have a paper version or an electronic version. And so one idea is to create um, their roadway book electronically. So here's an example of what you might do. You could use all kinds of different pictures from the internet of different things they might want to decorate their uh, book with. Of course, you don't want to do, you don't want, want to do a search um, for different images while you're working with the child because you never know what's going to pop up on the internet and they may be able to see that. But you might have a few kind of um, clip art photos or some images that you um, like from the internet you think the child might like ready to go. And if you could help them create this book through PowerPoint. And so you, all I did here was take a, an image of a rainbow and 
um, insert that into PowerPoint. So you, you, know, you might want to become more familiar with PowerPoint if you're not already. Um, or you could do it with Word as well. You could just um, kind of uh, insert the clip art into a Word document as well. Another way to do it would be to have them draw, just draw what they would like to on, on paper and sh just hold it up to the screen and show you what they've done. So they may be keeping the book with them or you may be keeping it um, online. You know, when you do the therapy in your office, we have you keep the roadway book in your office until the very end and that helps with privacy. So I do encourage you to think about that as you're deciding which way to go in terms of um, whether it's going to be an electronic book or paper book. So here's the About You worksheet with my made up uh, client here, Jasmine, um, having them complete all these questions, talk with you about the answers. This can be done um, you know, over your uh, video conference. And then of course, answering that important question of the event that happened to me is, and having them say that out loud, this is important to write down, as you know. So making sure it's really nice to, that everyone can see this when you write it down. Um, if the child does not wanna say it, um, you could um, you could ask the pa the parent to help. You could ask the child if it's okay to ask the caregiver caregiver to say it out loud, or if um, or if you can just write it down and see if they agree with what you've written down. So there are different ways to do this, but it, you know, again, what would you do in your office with um, with these kids? So thinking about what kinds of techniques you would use and how to apply them to uh, a video platform. All right, moving on to session two. This is the oppositional defiant uh, session. And, you know, as I encourage all of you who've done uh, my training, I, I typically do not skip this session, even though it says you can skip the session um, when there's not a lot of oppositional behavior. I usually don't because as one of, my, uh, uh, as one of the clinicians I trained um, put it, this is really an opportunity for success. And I really like thinking of it this way. And so it's not just a behavior plan, but it's a, it's a way for the child to feel like they've accomplished something that they can change their behavior. And so even if it's a child who's not very oppositional, there may be some little chore that their parent would like them to do or that they would like to start doing. And so you can develop a behavior plan around that. And so I encourage you to do this. And I think it's especially important now with COVID um, and now that we're all home together 24 seven, we may be seeing a lot more oppositional behavior and so there likely is some kind of um, behavior plan you can develop with the child and parent. Um, you may need to spend a little bit more time with um, parents thinking about how, uh, how, how they're doing and um, how the stress of COVID-19 is impacting them. And so there are different websites that you can refer them to, such as National, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and ctsn.org has a lot of good resources and there are other ones as well that I have at the end of the slides. Um, but th this could be important as far as sticking with routines. So, you know, there may be many, many things the caregiver wants to work on. They may want their uh, adolescent child to get out of bed before 2.30 in the afternoon. That might be something that they want to work on. That could be something to target in the behavior plan, but also might just be accomplished, um, you know, by the parent reading some, reading up on how to, how to stick to routines or consulting with you on this. And you might do a, a simpler behavior plan because you wanna make sure that it's gonna be successful. That's the important thing about these plans. This, is, this treatment is not for behavior, it, but this part of it, um, this particular session talks about how oppositional behavior is very common with PTSD. And so we do wanna address it, but we're not gonna change all the behavioral issues that are happening. Um, what we're counting on is that once the PTSD treatment um, is treated, then you'll see those behavior problems lessen as well. Um, so again, you need certain materials for the behavior plans. You're going to either mail them in advance or share your screen for them, but you want to make sure the child can see uh, whatever sticker chart or um, chore chart that you might develop with them um, in their home. You want to be able to see that. So you don't want to keep that on your computer because the child needs to be able to see that in their home throughout the week to remind them that um, they're working towards a goal. And then you complete the other uh, session content as usual. So that includes things like um, talking with parents about guilt and leniency. So a lot of parents may be more lenient during COVID-19. Uh, some of that is okay. They may need to do that so that they can work or they may need to do that just to kind of keep the peace in the household. 
but some of it is, um, could be related to trauma and feeling bad about what the child has been through. So making sure that parents are able to stick, decide what kind of structure and rules they want to have in their household during this time and follow through with those because those guidelines and structure for, are, are really important for kids. Okay, moving on to session three. Um, so this is typically the time in the treatment where you will decide whether or not you're going to split up the caregiver and child. Um, so I think it's important to have a conversation with the caregiver about whether you're going to keep them in the session. This may be really helpful to help them manage behavior, to help the child feel more comfortable. You could start off separate and then if the child wants to bring the caregiver back in, that would be fine. But having some kind of plan uh, ahead of time is very helpful. Um, and then again, you need your materials for this. So this includes the feelings chart and then the feelings in my body uh, handout and also the uh, cognitive triad worksheet for the older kids for that's the youth PTSD treatment manual. Um, so you can, I just picked this from the internet, different feeling spaces. Um, you, could, you could even have the child show you different feeling spaces or take pictures um, and use their, uh, their own face for your feelings chart. You can make it fun. Um, that's the important thing here is just to make it fun for these kids. Um, and then, let's see, for feelings in my body, this is one where, if you remember, you have the, the children talk about where they feel different emotions in their body. Let me see, oops. Let me see if I can draw on this again. There it is. So you could ask them to choose a color, what color, you know, what color do you think of when you think about the feeling mad? And then um, they may say red. And you may sit, ask them, well, where do you feel uh, mad in your body? What happens to your body when you feel mad? And they might say, I ball up my fists or my face feels flushed. And so you're going to kind of draw on that. Draw. Flushed cheeks. Of course, it's hard to do it with a mouse. But point an arrow, right, mad here, you get the idea, and then um, do that for the rest of the feelings in the body. And then you can um, take a screenshot of this and then make it a part of your electronic roadway book for the child. And so uh, that's one way to do it, um, which would be different from the way you might normally do it with a, a big piece of paper for the, for the um, younger children having a big piece of paper and drawing on that. Uh, you do need something for the roadway book anyway, so it, it might be nice to just do it this way electronically so that you can see it and it's much more interactive and they can choose the different colors um, and, make, and give them some, some agency over that. So it's better to have them choose what color you want to do it, even if you don't think of red when you think of, or you don't think of certain colors when you think of the feelings. It's nice to have kids um, be able to, to choose, especially when you're not in the office and they can't just simply pick up a, a marker and start drawing. Um, it, you may need to be, um, be thinking about ways that you can have the child make some choices and make it more interactive. Okay, and then going on to the next. Let's clear my drawings here. Okay. All right, and then um, if you remember the feelings thermometer from the manual, it's pretty, all the drawings in the manual are pretty, uh, pretty simple. And so this is actually an opportunity to get creative, um, to get on the internet, do searches for different images. And so this is um, a feelings thermometer I found on the internet and was able to upload into the PowerPoint. And so you can use this and refer back to this frequently. You know, when you're doing the exposures and the trauma narrative, you're going to ask them to check in frequently about how they're feeling. And you want to have um, a feelings thermometer that has a numerical scale. So not just one with colors um, that can help, but it's also nice to, to have a number um, so that you're recording that and you're tracking how the uh, kids are doing, whether or not their relaxation exercises are actually helping them um, calm down. It's nice to have numbers for that. So I picked one that has colors and numbers and words so that they can see um, and, and, and really connect this idea of gradations of feelings and learning to understand that in themselves. 
And then here's the cognitive triad worksheet that is um, a screenshot from the manual, from the youth PTSD treatment manual for older kids, that's seven and above. Um, and you can show this to them. And again, something that I always say is not on this handout that should be, is that there's a situation, something happens. There's a situation, and then you have thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in response to that situation. So again, you're gonna teach this as normal, as you normally would, um, but being sure that they can see, uh, the, see the visual while you're talking with them. All right, and then um, going on to session four. This is the session where you're teaching coping skills. So that's deep breathing, muscle relaxation, and happy place imagery. Those are the ones that we teach in the manual. So again, for the happy place imagery, you could have the child draw a picture of that and take a screenshot and um, send it to you. And then you can add it to the electronic roadway book. Or um, if, they're have the, if they have the ability to draw on the screen um, using whatever um, iPad they have, that might be a, another idea. Um, for deep breathing and muscle relaxation, the important thing is to um, make sure the camera is placed such that you can see them actually doing uh, the exercises. So you also have to move the camera, make sure to show them you know, that you're flexing your muscles or that you're expanding your diaphragm when you're breathing. That may be more difficult to see um, over a computer. And a word about phones, you know, I'm talking about this treatment as if it will be delivered on an iPad or a laptop. It would be much more difficult to do it um, using a phone because they can't see what you're doing as well. But it's still possible. Uh, you wouldn't want to not do it just because they, they don't have a laptop. But um, things, like, um, things like the relaxation techniques, again, you're going to need to, to make sure the camera placement um, is right. Again, you can use the screen sharing feature to do the uh, happy place imagery. And then GIFs uh, might be helpful and make it fun as well. Or GIFs, I'm not even sure how to say that, GIFs or GIFs. But these images online that, um, that you can show. So let me see if I can skip to that. Let's see if you can see that. All right, I'm going to show you this just there are a bunch of different um, images online that might be nice for um, teaching about deep breathing. Here's, I just did a Google search of deep breathing flower. And here are some things that came up. So you can teach them to inhale and exhale um, to the rhythm of this um, this ball that's expanding and contracting. So that might just be a nice kind of visual for them to do. There are flowers, there are different things that you can use. Can y'all see that? I'm not sure if you can see that or not. Can you see that ball expanding? Thumbs up, anybody? Yeah, we can see it, Dr. Murphy. Thank you so much. Okay. Good. So that, those are, that's one idea for that as well. Um, that might be nice. And so there are lots of different things and the clients are going to find this before you do. So <laughs> they may have ideas of where to get different things, um, where to get different images. So they may be able to teach you. And that would be nice for them um, to be able to teach you about how to, uh, you know, how to use this technology to do the therapy. Let's see. Let me get back to my slides. All right, let me take a pause there and see if there are any questions at this point. I think I can see the chat here. Let's see. We had a question from a while ago from Rita Harris. I'm not sure if it was answered or not. Her question was, what happens if client and parent are not able to read the documents? Okay, yeah. So um, if it's because, if you mean that they, they are unable to read, um, then you can certainly read it to them. Um, and I think that's very doable. 
over telehealth. Um, and then um, if you mean that they can't see them, that's kind of that issue I was talking about with if you're going to be using a phone, even a cell phone that might have video conferencing, you may not be able to see the document that well. Um, so again, reading it to them would be important to do. In fact, I, I usually do that with my clients. Um, most, of, most, most of the kids and families I work with, I do give them a copy and I also read it to them so that they can have it, they can follow along if they want to or can, um, but they don't have to and I will read it to, to them. All right, anything else right now? Because we're gonna be moving into the trauma portion of the treatment. Let's get back to my slides. And thank you guys for your patience. As I'm learning this as well, let's see. Okay. All right. Okay, so I think I talked about the um, different coping skills. Now, as you know, the um, session five is the turning point in the therapy. And so, um, just trying to move all these different toolbars off my slides so I can see them. Um, so again, for, for the trauma story, you want to consider whether the caregiver should be present. Um, you may have not, you may have had them out of the room, but you may want them back or the child may want them back. That is fine. Um, the pros and cons of this are um, some kids need their parents for reassurance as they're telling the trauma story. The con is to, of having parents present is that they may not be as forthcoming, they may, may not share as many details, they may feel the need to protect their caregiver if their caregiver was involved in the trauma. They may just want privacy, even if they're in their foster home with a foster parent, they may not want to share all those details with the foster parent. So you really need to weigh that with the caregiver and the child, whether or not you wanna have the caregiver present. Um, and again, if the, if the caregiver is gonna be present, you want to prepare them for how they will respond. Most, um, you know, they don't really need to say much at all. They just need to listen and they can, they can say, thank you for sharing that. Or they can say, I know that was hard, but they don't really need to say much of anything. Um, and that you're going to be, you know, discussing the details. You're going to be writing down the details of what happened with, with the client and that they, they don't need to do much and just, just be being there is enough. <clears throat> Again, you want to ensure that the home is safe for telling the trauma story, making sure that there's not ongoing trauma, not un ongoing abuse or any kinds of threats to safety or even to emotional safety. Um, make sure that they have some privacy for these, these next several sessions, which are going to be all about the trauma. Um, you can use Word or PowerPoint to type out the story. And um, from now on, you might want to have the caregiver plan, to, plan for the child to do a relax a relaxing activity after the session. And so, you know, these, these sessions do get tougher before they get easier. That's what we tell the parents that it may get a little bit harder now. They may show more symptoms, have more difficulty, but then it will get better as they work up through those exposures. But it could be nice to have a re relaxing activity planned after the session. And of course, we're limited in what we can do, um, but you can even just have them go for a walk around the block or play for a little bit with the parent, even watching TV something relaxing for the child after these sessions. So here's uh, the uh, scanned in uh, handout from the manual of the whole story of what happened. So I've just kind of have a portion of it here and um, you can choose which way you're going to record it. Uh, meaning, are you going to write on the screen? Are you gonna have them write um, where they are? Are you going to just take notes? For older kids, they may want to use the chat box. They may not want to tell you exactly what happened. So you can have them type in the chat box what happened and then you can copy it onto the paper that's going to go into their book. Um, let them know that you're going to do that, of course. But that might be a, a kind of a safer way for them to do it, or especially if other people are listening and they don't have privacy, that might be a nice private way to do that. And I also forgot to mention that you know headphones can also help. So even though other people in the home might be uh, able to hear what the client says, at least they would only hear the client and not the therapist and the client. And so that might add to um, a little bit more privacy to these sessions. 
uh, you can use clip art um, for, for younger kids. They might want to draw a picture. You might have the, the parent take a picture of it and send it to you again. Um, there are various ways to do this um, story. As I've been talking about all the handouts, you can use the same techniques for all the handouts. You do want to di visually display the hierarchy. This is a nice time for them to be able to see what you're seeing and talking about. And so this is a, just a retyped um, the handout words onto the screen so that you can see. Remember to ask them to put five parts of their story into a hierarchy, starting from the least anxiety provoking to the most anxiety provo provoking. And as I've spoken with you, those of you who do the preschool manual, for younger kids, you're gonna be a little bit more directive about that. And so you might um, come up with a hierarchy yourself and just kind of write it out and talk with them about, does this make sense? Or should we change the order of anything? For older kids, you really want them to have a lot more control over that and, and putting things in the right order. And then of course, some kids are not able to put things in order and having the, just five parts of the story is fine. It doesn't have to have to be in order. All right, and then um, I don't talk about this too often when I'm doing the training because it really doesn't come up as that much um, in the cases I've consulted with, but, but for, for these times when, when, again, families are together 24 seven, boundaries are really important. It's actually much harder to have boundaries in your home. Um, with many people in your home, you, you know, families may be sharing homes with other families. They may have many, many people in the, in the home. And so boundaries, are, are really hard to establish. And I'm talking about physical boundaries as well as emotional boundaries, especially if you're gonna have the caregiver participating in all the sessions. You wanna to talk to the caregiver about the need to establish boundaries. So helping everyone in the family understand that when, when the child is having their sessions that they need, other people need to respect their privacy. They, don't, they should not listen. They should not um, ask them what they talked about. The child should not be um, required to discuss anything about their trauma or anything about therapy sessions out, outside of the therapy session or the homework assignments. Um, this can be very challenging when, when, again, when families are home together all day long. Um, but ask the parent to think about different ways that they can respect their child's privacy. And check in about this frequently as needed. Make sure the child is feeling safe. You know, if the child all of a sudden starts to shut down in sessions, it may be that they feel like they don't have the privacy in, in their home to talk freely. And so maybe they're feeling like, you know, they don't want to do this anymore. So you do need to check in with them frequently about this. Okay, session um, six through 10 is the exposure, um, are the exposure sessions. And again, this is taking those five parts of the story, um, starting with the least anxiety provoking part and uh, working up through the hierarchy. So um, this may be an opportunity, having kids participate in, in their homes may be an opportunity for you as a therapist to participate in these in vivo exposures. You may, they also may have more opportunities to do this um, versus in your clinic. So, it's, there are pros and cons to that as well. Sometimes it's nice to have the clinic space so that um, it's not a reminder of the trauma. For example, if the trauma occurred at home or near their home, it may be nice for the, the child to practice in your office, but right now that may not be possible. So it may, they may be, um, it may be more challenging to find different practice types of exposures to do before you jump into the therapy. Um, but then once you're really in the thick of the trauma exposure treatment, then um, having those, you know, kind of in vivo live um, things to remind them of the trauma, trauma may be helpful. Um, again, you have them draw, write, or tell about that part of the story. And so there are different ways to do that and decide what, which your client would prefer. For older kids, of course, make it creative. Um, they can use clip art or different things, technology to make it interesting. Um, and then again, you can participate in the homework exposure. So, a lot of times our clients have a lot of trouble doing homework assignments where you're talking about the part of the story in the session and then they are supposed to go home and do a planned, um, planned exposure related to that part of the story. And you know, many of our families have trouble doing that. You might plan a, a midweek session to do that with them. You could um, you know, plan five minutes to have them do their exposure homework 
and you can be a part of that since um, you know we're doing everything remotely now we may have more time to be able to participate in these homeworks um, so that might that's one idea to kind of make sure that the kids are doing their exposure work um, but if you can't do that that's fine we know that just from practice that even when um, the families don't do the homework um, they, the kids still get better so at least take the opportunity during your sessions to um, be sure that they're they're actually thinking about that part of the story um, that they do their imaginal exposure where they close their eyes and think about it um, and then if you want you can add some kind of in vivo exposure as well so for example if trauma happened in the bedroom um, you may work up to that, um, work up to doing that. I wouldn't probably do that in the very first exposure, but they may work up to being able to tolerate their anxiety, manage their distress, and then think about their trauma while they're, they're in the bedroom and while their caregiver's there and while you're there participating by telehealth. For the older kids, um, you're going to be doing the cognitive restructuring with them. So uh, those of you who just work with the young kids, again, we don't do this for the preschool PTSD treatment model, but um, for older kids, these are the two handouts that we use to do cognitive restructuring. Um, the one on the left is the more commonly used one, which is the evidence for and evidence against worksheet. So again, you can just upload these onto the screen. The screen. You can write on them um, using your screen sharing tool or your annotation tool in Zoom. You can um, have the child tell you what you, you know, what they want you to write using the chat box um, and show it visually to them as you're working through it. And so again, this is taking one of their thoughts and then looking at what, what is the evidence for that or how, help, how helpful is that thought to me or um, how could we change that thought in order to change the feelings about what happened. So safety planning is also a part of session six through nine, um, and it may be even more important, but also more challenging during COVID-19. There may be more threats to safety uh, now. You know, there are lots of different, you know, there, illness is a, is a threat to physical safety. Um, there, you know, having kids at home with their families 24-7 um, may be also a little increased safety um, threats as well. So there are lots of different, um, issues um, that you may be considering when you're thinking about the safety plan. The safety plan should be related to the trauma. That's what the purpose of it is. So how to prevent, um, how to identify warning signs that the trauma might happen again and how to prevent that from happening or what kind of plan could they enact that would um, stop, stop it from happening again. So this is important to really think about what kind of plan you're gonna make, especially during COVID-19 and what's, what's possible. What are the options? Um, so sometimes we have safety plans around having kids go to their neighbor's house um, for safety. That might not be possible now. That might not be something that their neighbor wants them to do. Um, of course, you know, we would hope that, you know, if a child is really in danger of being hurt, that that would be okay for them to um, go seek help from a neighbor, but we should probably plan that out in advance. Um, you know, 911 is always an option as well. Uh, there are various ways to um, think about safety planning with these families, but you're going to have to, it might be a little bit more challenging right now because some of the options are, are more limited. All right, I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions about the exposures in particular, sessions six through 10. Okay, all right, so I will uh, rely on Lindsay to let me know if there are any questions. Uh, we'll move on to um, just some a word about um, maintaining engagement and managing oppositional behavior um, via telehealth. So this is, the, this is what everybody wanted to know about. And of course, I think this is a challenge um, and I certainly don't have all the answers. So maybe at the end we can exchange ideas as well. We should have some time for people to share their thoughts and their experience. Hopefully many of you have been doing this and you found some good strategies. Um, so um, I think about what are the things that I do in the clinic to maintain engagement? And you know, in the training, I, I uh, show several videos about this. 
One thing I do is create an agenda. This is something that's common in CBT, but it's not included in the manual. But I like to do this even with kids, young kids. Um, that's just a, a list of what you're gonna do during that session. So um, even for little kids, I'll write out something simple, which will be, you know, check in, which would just be, how are you doing today? And then um, complete worksheet. And then um, talk about the scary thing that happened. And then, um, plan homework and then maybe you get to do a fun activity together online if the child gets through all that. Um, so I, I do uh, create agendas for my clients, especially the ones who have more trouble um, with engagement and I refer back to it frequently. So I'll show it to them and I'll say, oh look, we, we did that and if I were in person I would have them put a sticker on it. But electronically I may put a little um, clip art star next to it to let them know that we're, we're done with number one, we're moving on to number two. Um, so that's one idea. And then also asking for the caregiver to help. Um, so um, it, making sure that they model uh, attending to the session. So you wanna have a conversation with the caregiver that this is not a time to be you know, using your phone and um, doing other things that, that really you want to help the child stay engaged and they may be more likely to do that if they see that you're engaged as you're looking at the screen or you're looking at the handouts and doing the work or you're doing the relaxation exercises. Um, so asking caregivers to help with that, helping them to redirect them back to the room if they um, leave the room, letting them know that, you know, maybe, maybe kids may need a break at a certain point during the session. So you may plan for a break and say, okay, as soon as we do this, you're gonna to get to go take a break and go do a lap around the house and then come back. Um, so that may be another way to keep um, kids who are more active engaged. Um, we talked about candy and snacks again. Um, for younger children, I think it's important to keep the session shorter. Um, you know, an hour on uh, telehealth is a long time for adults. So think about it for a little kid that may be way too much for them. 30 minutes may be enough. Um, if you're concerned with kind of billing and how do you bill for such a short session, or you know, if you need to keep the session length long for some longer for some reason, you may um, have the child's portion be 30 minutes and then spend the rest of the time checking with the caregiver. Um, and then change activities frequently. So give them a variety of different things to look at on the screen. Um, not just words, but visuals, videos, um, different things that may be visually appealing to them, have them look at you some, some of the time, but also look at the handouts and things like that. Keep up a fast pace, and that's gonna be challenging at first because we, we don't have a lot of practice doing this, um, but keep up a fast pace as you can. And if you have kind of a technical failure, maybe you're trying to pull up something on the internet and it's just not loading for some reason, move on to the next thing. I wouldn't spend too much time um, having the child wait for, for um, you know, the te technical issues to resolve. Keep it interactive. Um, so as you're, as you're maybe pulling up something different um, on your computer, talk with the, the child, try to have a conversation. You know, we're just gonna be multitasking during these sessions. As you do, as any of you who work with young kids are always doing in your offices as well, right? So keeping it interactive, talking with them, asking them, you know, what's the weather outside where you are? Oh, it's really sunny outside my house, you know, things like that, just to keep them engaged. For older children who may, you know, may appear to be uh, resistant or grumpy, they don't want to, they don't want to do this session. Um, give them some control over it, so they may not want to sit right up on the, um, you know, to the to this camera. They may not want to show the, you their whole face. Let them know it's important that you see them um, for much of the session. But if they want to sit a little bit farther back, that's fine. Um, or if they, they want to choose their background in Zoom, for example, choose the background that they show. They may, hey, do you want to be in outer space today? Where do you want to be today? Let's choose your background and have them um, have a little bit more sense of control over these sessions. Also, it's helpful with um, older kids to really be collaborative in planning the session. So you may say, you know, we have these things to do today. Which one do you want to do first? Or which one do you think is important to do first? You know, having them really help plan out the session could be, um, helpful as well. For more avoidant or oppositional behavior, so I tend to think that a lot of the oppositional behavior we see in these sessions is related to avoidance about the trauma, that they don't want to talk about the trauma or they're too anxious to talk about it or they haven't learned to regulate their uh, anxiety yet. 
um, to be able to talk about it. So they're acting out and it looks like oppositional behavior. So that, that's mostly what I see in these sessions. And so if you can think about it that way, <clears throat> then what you really want to target is this anxiety. You want to target what, um, what they're feeling about talking about the trauma. And if you can help them not avoid um, and help them learn to regulate their emotions, which is the point of sessions one through four, um, then they should be better able to talk about their trauma. So you may have a little bit more uh, trouble in the beginning when they're you know, not used to doing telehealth, not used to talking about their trauma directly. But once they learn the coping skills, I find that's really helpful to have them practice that. Whenever I see them starting to get up, run around the room, say, I wonder how you, you're feeling right now. You look like you're feeling a big scared. Uh, let's do our relaxation exercises, for example. Um, and let me see your muscles. Oh, show them, go right up to the screen. Let me see, let me see your breathing. Show me how you can do that. Oh, should we pull up that image of the flower again? Let's do the breathing together and have them focus on that for a little while. And hopefully they can reset and proceed with the, the, the session. Um, it's a lot to manage for sure. And there's no easy answer. So, so in, in tricks that work for one kid are not going to work for the other. So you really do have to individually tailor this. This is, you know, an evidence-based treatment. It's manualized. There are certain steps to follow, but you have to learn to tailor it to each child, of course. Um, and then make sure, you know, have this reminder about using a matter-of-fact tone when talking about trauma. And that's because sometimes kids become more anxious if they think that we're anxious talking about it. So um, this is just to remind you to um, help them remember that they're there to talk about the, the scary thing that happened and that you're gonna teach them ways to feel better. They're gonna feel better about it after they learn to talk and tolerate their um, feelings and make those scary feelings go away. So again, talking about that with them, reminding them why they're there, why they're there seeing you, and reminding them of the rationale for the things you're asking them to do. The more you talk about it, the better you'll feel. That may help them kind of ease their anxiety, but also ease your own anxiety, that this treatment will work if we um, stick with it. And then uh, again, asking for caregiver assistance, using the agenda, all those techniques I just told you about can also be helpful in managing oppositional behavior, keeping sessions short, using those relaxation strategies whenever you see that they may be getting anxious. Of course, praising often and enthusiastically. When you see that they're sitting there um, completing a handout or when they actually do answer a question that you have, oh, that's great to hear, you know, that's great to hear you um, answering answering me, telling me about what's outside. Oh, I, I, like, I like hearing your voice over the computer. Um, you know, I like seeing your smile, things like that, that let them know that you're really paying attention. That can go a long way. And then you may uh, develop a reward system just to help them get through the session. So I've suggested this to many clinicians um, who are dealing with oppositional behavior in their office, uh, developing that reward system. If they get through the agenda, they get through those four or five um, steps on the agenda, then they get a small reward. This could be, maybe you all could read an ebook together. There are lots of electronic books that are available um, for free right now that you could um, share with your clients. You might have a, a few on your computer ready to pull up so that you can read together. That might be their reward or play a video game if you um, are so inclined and know how to do that. Um, or um, just talking or chatting, you know, or drawing together. Uh, by the computer could be um, a reward as well. So something with you would be nice. Um, also possibly developing some kind of reward system with the caregiver could be helpful, but you may not be, have much control over following through with that. So it would be nice to, to set up the reward to be something fun that you could do with, um, with the child. So in, in your office that might, be, that might have been playing together. You can still play together. Some kids you know, really expect to play. Um, they know about therapy and they expect to play. And so you might say, hey, why don't you go get your special toy that you wanted to show me and um, I'll show you some of my toys and we can play for five minutes, you know, after you complete, you know, X, Y, Z, things like that. That could be um, motivation for them to finish the session. And as you might remember, um, through doing some of these sessions, it takes practice. So you may see a lot of this oppositional behavior in the beginning but the next week it might get better and then they get used to you asking them about their feelings and asking them to do relaxation strategies and praising them. And so they get used to the setup of the session and it gets easier over time.
So we could spend a lot more time on that, I'm sure. And um, we, we should have time for questions at the end. But moving back to the uh, manual, session 11 is about relapse prevention. And um, again, you can upload the handouts electronically so that they can see them. But this is where the child draws themselves and a trauma reminder in the near future and then as an adult. So thinking about, you know, letting, praising them. Wow, we've gotten a session 11. Wow, you've worked so hard to learn to make those scary thoughts and feelings go away. But there may be times in the future where you are reminded of that scary thing that happened and you might have some of those feelings come back. But the difference is now you know what to do about that. And so you talk about how they learn to manage their scary thoughts and feelings and what they've learned about that and then have them draw themselves thinking of, or seeing, about, seeing something that reminds them of the trauma or thinking about something that reminds them of the trauma and then what they would do. So usually kids draw pictures of themselves um, doing their relaxation strategies, for example. Um, using PowerPoint, Word, um, things like that to, sh to show the picture to, to have them draw the picture on uh, electronically is helpful again. And then session 11 is also uh, the time to start planning for graduation. So you're going to have a graduation ceremony, even though it will be remotely, as we are all learning to do. Um, and unfortunately, you won't be able to be in the same room and um, bring them a special snack as you normally might do, but you can talk to the caregiver about having that available. Maybe you could play music um, over the internet. You can think about who would be um, attending that. So sometimes kids really want their whole families to come see them graduate. So plan that ahead of time. And sometimes you might have, you might discuss whether you're gonna review the entire um, roadway book with the whole family there, or maybe have a little portion of time with just the caregiver and the therapist looking at the um, roadway book together and then have the, the rest of the family join for a celebration. Um, so you wanna talk that over with them. And then discussing the future therapy plan. A lot of times, um, if PTSD is the only presenting problem after this treatment, they don't need treatment um, any further, or they may just need booster sessions or check-ins every, every now and then. Um, but discuss with them how they're, discuss with the caregiver and the child if they're old enough, um, how they've been feeling and how they've been uh, behaving in the home to see whether or not you need to continue therapy beyond um, this treatment. <clears throat> Again, uh, session 12 is graduation. So typically that would be with the child and caregiver um, together with you. You know, these celebrations are very meaningful, especially now. Um, you know, any reason to celebrate is, is a good thing. And so um, making sure you plan time for that. So you review the book together. And then again, you're going to give the client a copy of the book. So if, if they've kept it the whole time, that's, that's fine. They can keep it. It would be nice for them to um, maybe take pictures of it, send it to you um, so that you can have a copy for your records. Or um, if you have it on your computer, be sure to get it to them in some form, email or printed um, version to them so that they can keep it if they want it. Most times the kids do want it, uh, occasionally they don't, but most times they do. And so you wanna make sure they, they have a copy of that. Um, and also um, being sure to send them a certificate. The kids love getting the certificates. Um, and so you wanna create one, you can create a nice one with different templates from the internet being sure to have your signature on it or something that looks like your signature on it um, because that's especially meaningful to the kids to, um, to see that they've accomplished something. All right, so I'm gonna stop and ask if there are any questions. Thank you so much for your patience and attention as I uh, do this first, very first training on YPT and PPT via telehealth. It's a learning experience for me as well. So I'm gonna open it up for questions. And you can use the chat box to submit questions or raise your hand or just kind of jump in. I'm not sure if everyone's unmuted yet.
Everyone now has permission to unmute yourselves. So if you do have a question, feel free to just um, on the bottom left hand bar, unmute your microphone and you can ask the question. I see one, let's see. Okay, I have a question in the chat box. Thank you, Emily. Nice to hear from you. Um, wondering what, I'm wondering what your approach to using YPT with multiple siblings. Um, thank you for asking that. So um, that is definitely doable. Um, so, the thing to think about is um, if, it, if they experience the same trauma, they still may have a different response to that trauma. So I would not see them together. Um, and so, you know, it may be very tempting to do that over telehealth since everyone's in the home and it may be um, just so much easier to have siblings together learning the material. That may be fine for the first four sessions. Um, but I would not do the trauma piece um, together with siblings. So it would be important to talk with the caregiver about the best way to proceed. So if they, if it's possible to um, dedicate some time to each sibling, you may even want to do it on different days to make sure that, um, you know, there's no overlap in the sessions. That may not be possible, um, but, but feel it out with the caregiver. Don't assume that they can't do it. Um, let them know what would be ideal for you, which I think um, the ideal scenario is to have a dedicated treatment time for each child. Um, and so that may be an hour, that may be half an hour, but at least some dedicated therapy time throughout the week where the caregiver can participate with each child. If that's not possible, then do it on the same day back to back. Um, if, it, if, it, if the caregiver insists on having the, the kids together, I would, I, would, I would be okay with that for the first four sessions, as I, as I said. Um, but I really think it's important for the kids to have their own personal time and space to, to um, discuss their trauma experiences and the way that they saw the trauma. So, because many times kids may feel, um, one, one sibling may feel responsible for the trauma. For example, if it was a fire and they're older or they've been placed in the role of caring for their siblings and one of their siblings got hurt in the fire and they feel responsible for that. So then you have an older kid who's dealing with something much different than the younger kid. So does it make sense really for them to be participating together? Family therapy could be helpful for them, but that is not, that's not what we, you would do uh, using the, the PPT or YPT manuals. So that's my answer. Thank you for asking that. Any other questions right now? I was curious if you were sending out, I don't know if I missed it before I signed on, were you sending out this PowerPoint? Yes, I will. Okay. Yes, it will probably come from, um, from Lindsay. Right. Yeah. Okay, so there's still plenty of time to ask questions. So if you're thinking of some, go ahead and put them in the chat box or, or let us know somehow that you're going to um, you have questions, I've got a few more slides. Um, so these will be, whoops, these will be included when I send out the slides, but um, there are some resources out there for doing uh, tra trauma treatment by telehealth, which is great. I learned about these in the course of preparing for this presentation. So TFCBT, their website has several videos and several links to different resources, such as this telehealthfortrauma.com. They have a number of resources. So as you may know, because some of you I know have training in both modalities, um, the uh, approach is a little bit different um, in TFCBT versus these two manuals. But some of the information that they provide in the trainings overlaps with what I've said today. So it could be helpful to look at that again. Uh, they may give you other ideas. And then there's a number of printed material or, or PDF materials um, that are available on these websites as well. So the, those two may be worth a look. 
Um, and then I mentioned nctsn.org. That uh, website has a wealth of information about different types of trauma, um, information, psychoeducation, resources um, for caregivers, providers, kids. Um, and so that's worth a look and also looking at specifically about COVID-19, different resources to help families in struggling, uh, who are maybe struggling during this time. Uh, the CDC, of course, also has a lot of information. Um, they talk about, they have some for parents as well. Um, so I, uh, it's another reliable website that I go to and I direct parents to when they need information about uh, COVID-19 and also helping deal with uh, the stress of parenting during COVID-19. Also want to mention that the Louisiana Children's Museum um, did a series of parenting webinars um, in conjunction with our department here at Tulane um, on the uh, on COVID-19 and different um, topics related to parenting. So you might want to check that out as well. These are some of the, the references I used for this. Um, this uh, the, the last one, the ResearchGate publication was from the American Psychological Association um, website. So they have a number of um, webinars and uh, publications and tips, sheets about um, doing telehealth. And so if you didn't get enough through this uh, webinar, you can go check that out. And it might be worth it to do a training. So you may want to do some kind of training in Zoom to learn how to use all the features in Zoom. Uh, if you're going to be doing, I think telehealth is, is here to stay for us, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, as the case may be. But I think we're going to be using this for quite some time. So it would be a good idea to go ahead and invest in some training in that um, so that you can become more um, familiar with all the different features that um, these platforms have to offer. All right, so I'm going to go through some of these questions if no one else has questions and feel free to jump in. But I just want to make sure I got all your questions answered. Um, so we talked a lot about parent participation, talked about using this, this um, using telehealth, starting with new clients, we discussed that, implementing the techniques by telehealth. Uh, yes, all sessions are done by teletherapy. Um, and then signing and writing documents to clients, we talked about that, how to use the worksheets, managing avoidance behaviors like running, we talked about that as well. Um, managing the environment um, is, is definitely a challenge, but we did talk about some ways to do that. You know, not all clients are going to be able to do this, and so that is important to consider some of those rule outs that I mentioned in the beginning and thinking about other modalities for them or other ways to um, help the families that really cannot participate via telehealth. Um, we talked about the different activities and exercises, preparing parents and children to get started, um, keeping the kids' attention, um, and then um, keeping them engaged without moving all around the room. Some of that, you know, some of that's therapist uh, tolerance level. So I, you know, for me, that's okay. I want to be able to see the kids um, as much as possible. And I'm going to tell them that, you know, I need to be able to see you um, every now and then, or I need to be able to see what you're drawing. So hold it up to the camera, for example. But personally, I'm okay with them moving around the room um, somewhat. Um, again, we didn't talk about this, but making sure that the camera is stable, uh, asking the, the caregiver to put the, the laptop or the iPad or a phone in a place that's going to be stationary, not allowing someone to hold it, that, would, that will really help as well. Um, ensuring privacy, we talked about that and how effective this will be. Um, we know the YPT program is effective. How effective it will be via telehealth remains to be seen, but there is some evidence from the trauma-focused CBT folks that have been using um, telehealth for some time now that it can be effective via telehealth as well. So I am very optimistic that these um, two manuals will be, be just as effective um, via telehealth. So what to do, oh, this is an important, okay, let's see, I'm skipping ahead. Um, how to manage resistance while providing telehealth. So again, you wanna understand the source of the, of the resistance and there seems to be an alarm in my building right now. Uh, I'm going to keep talking until I can't anymore, but um, managing resistance, this, this may be avoidance. So, to, so you want to decide if this is about um, the child not wanting to talk about the trauma or not feeling safe to talk about the trauma, or maybe it's still going on. What are the reasons for the resistance? That's the important thing to think about. 
And then if you remember, there's a reluctance checklist in the manual. And at a minimum, you should be asking about reluctance each week. And that's not something I mentioned because that's just part of the therapy uh, that's in the manual. But um, remembering to ask your clients, um, how reluctant was the child to come to this session today? How reluctant was the child to participate? Did the parent have a, um, a big struggle with getting them to come to the desk to look at the computer? Um, or, um, you know, did, does the parent have any reluctance? And then I always mention, <laughs> and I always mention to um, therapists as well that we may be having reluctance as well. We're dealing with a lot of stress. This is not something I spend much time on. But the therapists are also in the middle of this you know, COVID-19 um, situation. So we are also a little bit, you know, more stressed maybe than usual. So we need to really think about, do we have the bandwidth to do this therapy? Are we able to deliver this by telehealth? Are we going to have the patience to, to, with ourselves and with our clients to be able to do this effectively? So really thinking about that is important as well. Some of us don't have a choice. We need to continue working. But, but making sure you kind of address your own stress in order to be available for your clients is important. Um, this next one, what do you do if the child becomes inconsolable and you're not in the room? That's a really important one. And I, I think that um, having protocols set up ahead of time uh, will be important. So that might be a time to kind of say, you know, enact your uh, emergency protocol. So that might be, you know, if the parent's not in the room, letting the child know that if, you know, if you're, if you're not able to speak, uh, not, if you're not able to talk in a few minutes, I'm going to go ahead and text your mom to come back in the room um, to help you, you know, letting them know ahead of time that you will be doing that. You can't plan for every single emergency, of course, or every situation, but maybe having a discussion up front. And I think that can be where some of your test run sessions might be helpful. So you can get to know the client. If this is not a client you worked with before, um, you want to get to know them. How will they be? Are they, are they a client that might tend to, to cry um, throughout most of the session? You're not able to understand them. They may not be able to do this particular therapy uh, right now. You may want to spend some time just getting to know them or, or having sessions um, that are less structured um, in the beginning. So I think to deal with um, kids who are inconsolable, I think really requires a lot of planning up front. What would you do in your office and how could you apply that to telehealth? Um, and sometimes just sitting with them as they're, as they're crying can be helpful. So really judging whether this is uh, typical for the child or unusual. Do you need um, the caregiver to assist you or do you think that you can uh, manage it just with the child through um, the video? And then finally, we had the question of how to implement using audio only. So I did not talk much about that. I think that would be very challenging. Um, you'd have to have the right client for that. Um, and what I mean by that is you have to have a very motivated client, very motivated parent and child, um, ones who want to do this therapy no matter what. So we've had, I've had a number of families tell um, me or therapists that I'm working with that you know, they're committed to, to getting this treatment, even with COVID-19, they don't want to hold this up because the child's really struggling. So if that's the case, then you can make it work, I think. And so let's say you can only do um, audio by phone. Make sure that the parents have the manual, uh, have the handouts. So if you needed to mail that to them, have that ahead of time before you get started, make sure they have all the materials they need, and then you're just going to talk, talk it through. Walk them through the different handouts by phone. Um, but again, it's going to take the right family to do that. If you've got a, you know, a child who's running in and out of the room, phone is probably not going to be possible. Um, phone phone uh, therapy, at least in this format, probably won't be possible. All right. Anything else right now? Any other questions? Okay, if you don't see your question, oops, if you don't see your question um, on the list, uh, if I didn't, if I didn't show you, let's see, stop the share. Uh, if I did not play, show your question, that's because it was submitted after um, I did these slides. Um, so um, I apologize for that, but you can take a, a time now to ask the question. Otherwise, if there's nothing else, Lindsay, do you have any announcements? Well, thank you so much for your participation and attention, and good luck.